What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about the difference between neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, malignant hyperthermia, and serotonin syndrome. I wanted to put all of these three together because you'll see these three uh, presented in questions in different ways and just simply by looking at the medicine that the patient was given and some of the main side effects you can distinguish between these three uh, fairly easily. So let's jump right into this. Here's a breakdown of the main characteristics to distinguish between the three conditions. So for the first one, malignant hyperthermia. Uh, think back from what you've learned about malignant hyperthermia. Uh, we know that it's dealing with the ryanidine receptor, and we know that that ryanidine receptor is basically constitutively um, expressed and turned on at all times. So because it's constantly turned on, it's constantly releasing a calcium out. So that's the mechanism of action, and we know that malignant hyperthermia can be treated with dantrolene, which is a ryanidine um, antagonist. So that makes sense. It will basically stop that ranadine receptor from being constitutively turned on. So here's the things you need to remember about malignant hyperthermia. Uh, before I get to this, all three of these conditions, you need to know they're going to present with autonomic instability. So you're going to see um, increased pulse, increased, um, increased blood pressure, and uh, you're going to see muscle rigidity. You're going to see that as those three things in all of these. So the things that I've listed out here are after you already know that and you know you have a situation of one of these three, how then do you know which of these three it could be? And this is what the video is going to cover. So for malignant hyperthermia, uh, the first thing you need to know is this happens in minutes. So for malignant hyperthermia, if the patient presents uh, minutes after taking the designated drug that causes malignant hyperthermia, which we'll get to, um, then you need to be leaning towards malignant hyperthermia. The next thing is malignant hyperthermia causes decreased bowel sounds, or you could even say that uh, a, a situation of a constipation. But because it happens so fast, you wouldn't really begin. You wouldn't be able to know that constipation were to occur because that would take longer to monitor the patient, figure out okay the patient is constipated. So just know decreased bowel sounds is unique compared to the other two situations. Whereas uh, serotonin syndrome, you'll see increased bowel sounds, and NMS, you're going to see no change in the bowel sounds. Okay, and then the last thing to know is the medications that cause malignant hyperthermia is going to be the inhaled anesthetics. Okay, I didn't say, remember, inhaled specifically. It can be any of the inhaled technically. Um, halothane is very common that causes this, but it can be any of them. You need to know, though, the inhaled, not the intravenous an anesthetics, not the localized anesthetics, specifically the inhaled anesthetics. And also another thing, some of the antiemetics can cause this. One example is metoclopramide. Okay, so um, you can see only a few of them can cause it, but know that those two, inhaled anesthetics and antiemetics, can cause malignant hyperthermia, minutes onset, and decreased bowel sounds. Next is serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome happens uh, because of basically too much serotonin that's in the synaptic clefts, or too much serotonin, let's say, that's released. So any drug, and remember serotonin, a 5-HT is another way to say serotonin. It means the same thing. So 5-HT agonist, anything that will increase 5-HT. Uh, think of the all of those antidepressant drugs. Remember the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those drugs are what stop serotonin from being reuptaken into the presynaptic membrane. And it therefore you have an increased level of the drug in the cleft, and now that isn't you're gonna have an increased response because now you have more 5-HT that bind to the postsynaptic membrane at the receptors. So any drug that causes an increase in serotonin can cause serotonin syndrome. So here are the distinguishing characteristics for serotonin syndrome. Uh, it's hours onset, so instead of minutes onset, it can take a little bit longer for this drug. Uh, here's a really important one. Increased pupil size. In any question I've ever done with serotonin syndrome, they usually will tell you increased pupil size or they'll just give you the drug. Say They'll, they'll say the patient is only taking like a certain drug and you know that that drug is a 5-HT agonist or it's an SNRI or an SSRI or an antidepressant or whatever it may be. So then they're usually going to give you one of those two characteristics to help you lean towards serotonin syndrome. But also know that serotonin syndrome causes hyperreflexia. Now these other two, malignant hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, so number one and number three respectively, 
they cause hyporeflexia. So that's why I didn't put them under the characteristics because two of them have it. I'm only writing these unique characteristics here. But serotonin syndrome specifically of these three causes a hyperreflexive state. So if you do the knee tap reflex where, you know, you have the little reflex hammer and you hit their right at their um, below the patella bone at that reflex area, they're going to be hyperreflexive. So you'll barely tap it and their knee, will, their leg will just rocket upwards. And that's a, uh, a symptom of serotonin syndrome to distinguish between these other two. Another thing is increased bowel sounds. So the way I remember that this one has increased bowel sounds is because 5-HT or serotonin, another another way to remember to say it is 5-HT, remember that that is the main uh, neurotransmitter involved in carcinoid tumors and carcinoid syndrome. And remember in carcinoid syndrome, one of the main ways to recognize carcinoid syndrome involving that tumor that take, that's uh, found usually in uh, small uh, small intestines Um, is going to be uh, excessive like diarrhea or increased bowel sounds. So that helps you to remember, okay, that makes sense. In serotonin syndrome, you have a lot of serotonin. And just like in carcinoid tumors or carcinoid syndrome, you have increased bowel sounds or you would have a situation of diarrhea. And that makes sense here. And then the drug, of course, we already talked about it. The drug that causes this is 5-HT agonist. Now, here's a tip for remembering increased pupil size. This is unique. Uh, um, again, for serotonin syndrome, increased pupil size or increased pupils. The way to remember this is I pronounce serotonin syndrome as like serotonin and the word C, S-E-E. So ser- since serotonin starts with an S and it's the only one that starts with an S here, S for C. So you just imagine you see more with increased pupils. You're bringing, there's more like light able to come in, even though that may not necessarily be true. You know, it's not like your vision improves with when your pupil size is way too big. But I mean, in, in In excess, it can be a problem, but just that'll help you remember that, that serotonin syndrome and the word C will help you remember, okay, there's more light entering into the eye. This must be the one with increased pupil size, okay? And then also, to help you remember with malignant hyperthermia, let's jump back to number one. To help you remember with malignant hyperthermia that you're going to have decreased bowel sounds, imagine the temperature. So of these three, malignant hyperthermia has the highest body temperature like kind of on average of the of all of these three. So all of them are going to have an increase in body temperature, but malignant hyperthermia you're usually going to see in excess of 40 degrees Celsius. It's one of the highest body temperatures. Kind of you should be leaning and thinking towards malignant hyperthermia. So when you have an increase in body temperature that is that high and that excessive, imagine that you're now beginning to shut down cell function and neural uh, neural function. And we know that neural function plays into the function of the parasympathetic system and the GI tract as well. If you heat up the body so much, you your brain basically gets shut down and you lose neural function. With a loss in neural function, you will lose that parasympathetic input um, and, and that uh, vagal input then into the uh, GI tract. So the temperature gets so hot that you will have decreased bowel sounds, your, uh, your GI tract will not work properly. So that will help you remember decreased bowel sounds for malignant hyperthermia. And again, serotonin syndrome, think serotonin C. So you're bringing in more light, uh, more light into the eyes because of that increased pupil size. The last one is neuro, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This has, a, this has the longest onset. So if they tell you that a patient has taken uh, whatever drug may cause this, cause this, which the drug that causes this one is going to be the D2 antagonist, that means dopamine receptor type 2 antagonist. The dopamine type 2 antagonist is what causes neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And this happens, it takes a couple days for this to even happen. So you're taking some sort of D2 antagonist, you're taking a lot of it. And all of a sudden, a few days later, you begin to see these symptoms. And of course, it's the same. uh, These are the unique symptoms that I'm giving you here. Days onset, no change in bowel. So this one, whereas serotonin syndrome had an increased bowel sound. Remember, I said think of carcinoid for that one. Whereas malignant hyperthermia, the temperature gets so hot that you have decreased bowel sounds. You're basically shutting down the neural function. This one has the no, it's no change in the bowels. It's kind of the in-between one. And the drug, the drugs that cause this are the D2 antagonist. Okay, so the D2 antagonists, uh, they're also called antipsychotic drugs. So they'll set this up with a situation of saying a patient comes in 
who has schizophrenia or some sort of psychosis. Or, you know, so these are those antipsychotic drugs, the D2 antagonists. And think back to the pharmacology lectures. There are typical and atypical antipsychotics. Um, I don't remember if I have a video on that or not, but I, I go into detail. If, if I don't have a video, I'll make a video where I go into detail about the difference between the typicals and the atypicals, which one has more of a risk of Parkinson, um, like, uh, like Parkinsonism type uh, situations and muscle muscle problems and whatnot but, whatnot, but we'll get into that in another video. So I just wanted to, I hope this helps just breaking down these three conditions because in medical school, at least for me, the way I learned this was these were all separated according to the chapter in pharmacology that you were in. And you lose track of being able to distinguish between the three because they're presented at separate times. And I was never presented these three situations all at once to say, okay, this is how you recognize it. This is the difference in symptoms of each of them and how to distinguish between the three. So when you get to the step one, this will help you to answer any question right. So let's jump into a question. A 36-year-old patient has to undergo surgery to fix a forearm fracture after skateboarding. After the surgery, the patient was sent to the emergency room with a pupil diameter of 6 millimeters. Okay, so I'm going to stop you there. Let me get my pen function ready here. A pupil diameter of 6. So just kind of keep in mind, 2 to 4 millimeter pupil diameter is normal. Okay, I'll just tell you that. So a pupil diameter of 6 millimeters is high. So we already have increased pupil size. Okay. We also know that the patient has undergone surgery to fix a forearm fracture, so the patient probably in that surgery um, had some sort of anesthetic. So there was some anesthetic use in this patient. All right, so the patient, uh, so we said about the pupil diameter, and now the patient was given halothane with nitrous oxide before the procedure, okay? They were given halothane with nitrous oxide. So these two drugs are inhaled anesthetics. And he has a history of depression. So he also has a history of depression over the last few years for which he's being treated. So he's taking antidepressants. So he is on inhaled anesthetics and antidepressants. So you need to be thinking of the two, you know, those are two drug classes which cause two of the three uh, of the conditions. The sister of the patient said that he had diarrhea a few times before he was sent to the ER. So now we have another symptom. We have increased bowel sounds or a situation of diarrhea before the symptoms got really bad with a pupil diameter of 6 millimeter. And look at his vitals. Blood pressure was 160 over 110. That's high. So that's increased. Pulse was 119. So we know pulse, a uh, heart rate of 60 to 100 is normal. 119 is too high. That's increased. And body temperature was 101.6. That's also increased. Which of the following drugs would most likely be responsible? Pupil diameter of 6 millimeters is high. Remember I said the mnemonic for serotonin syndrome is C and you're, you have an increased pupil size, so that's pointing towards um, serotonin syndrome. Also, he's had diarrhea a few times before he was sent to the ER, so we have increased bowel sounds. So right there is enough information that we know. We know that um, a history of depression, we know how to treat for antidepressants, the main ones are SSRIs and SNRIs, and some, some lower yield ones are like the MAO, um, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but we're just talking about these main ones. So this is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Nonetheless, regardless of which one he's on, both of them will increase 5-HT. Increase 5-HT. And an increase in 5-HT, another word for 5-HT is serotonin. We know that too much serotonin causes an increase in pupil size and will cause increased bowel sounds in the situation of serotonin syndrome. So now, which of the following drugs would most likely be responsible for this situation? Well, let's find a drug that is an SNRI or SSRI. Well, paroxetin, we know. Paroxetin is the SSRI. Olanzapine, so olanzapine, not in every single case but the vast majority of cases when you see this pine ending or pain ending then you know that is a, a d2 antagonist and atypical so that's not it because a d2 antagonist causes neuroleptic malignant syndrome halothane is an inhaled anesthetic so we know inhaled anesthetics doesn't cause it so nitrous oxide is also an inhaled anesthetic uh, we know that halothane and nitrous oxide those inhaled anesthetics we know that those cause malignant hyperthermia and we know it can't be malignant hyperthermia because the patient has increased pupil size. And in malignant hyperthermia, you would see decreased bowel sounds. This patient had increased bowel sounds. Uh, succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is a depolarizing muscle relaxant. 
And we know that uh, that also doesn't cause that for the serotonin syndrome. And then phenytoin, which is just an anti-seizure or anti-epileptic medication. So that doesn't cause any of the three. So the answer is A. I hope this helped. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow, share the video, and I will see you next time.